Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to this lovely Tuesday. I hope that you've had a good week so far and that you're ready to continue learning about the atom. And then we're moving on to the periodic table and everything that the periodic table has to teach us. Okay, so I don't know if you remember, but last time we were talking about energy levels and orbitals, and we spoke about the fact that in your atom, I'm just going to draw it here and then we'll see what it says, in the atom, there is obviously your nucleus, which has got protons and neutrons in it, okay, neutrons, and then you have energy levels, okay, and energy levels have got your electrons in, and remember these energy levels, well, if you want to think of it, there's orbitals, okay, and what happens is we said that there were different orbitals around the atoms. And in fact, I'm going to erase this and start again because I actually want to show you something. So you've got your nucleus. Let's just call it N for nucleus, okay? Which And a proton, why not? Okay, now the first energy level is made up of only one S orbital. Remember in the last lesson we said that the S orbital was spherical. So here we go. And remember we said it was basically a broad area we were round about you're most likely to find your electrons. So it's not a specific line and it's a space in, in it's an area in space. And on top of that, it is not 2D, it's three dimensional. So you've got to think sphere, but obviously I can't draw three dimensional. So you guys have to think about it, okay? Then we've got the next energy level. And the next energy level is made up of an S orbital, which we're going to draw here like this, okay? S orbital. I know, I'm sorry, my drawing's already bad. But what I'm trying to show you is that remember that this is like, it's like a three or four lane highway. So it is where you are most likely to find your electrons. So it can be quite broad, okay? It is not a straight little line that, that the electrons travel through all the time. But there are also two, three P orbitals. And every one of these stands for one specific P orbital. And remember what the P orbitals look like? They were like dumbbells. So I'm going to choose a green as well because I wanted to show you that it still belongs to the second energy level, but this is an icky green, but there we go. So it comes out and it comes out, okay, and then it goes up and it comes down and then it goes across and then it goes across. Okay, so those are your 3P orbitals where this is one orbital. Okay, that one there. This one here is another orbital here. And this one here is another one. And you've got to think of them as three dimensional. So in other words, there's one that does this, that's that orbital there. There's another orbital that goes from left to right that's this one here, and there's one that goes into and out of the page, and they're all at 90 degrees to each other because they're three-dimensional, and that's that third one there. And that would be your 3P orbitals. So each of these blocks stands for an orbital, right? And remember what I said to you, and this is very important, the electrons do not go like this. They do not go along here and along there and along there. They are continuing to go around the nucleus of the atom. They're orbiting around the nucleus of the atom. It's just that they are most likely to be found in this area. So what's pretty cool about this, and I'm going to draw it in blue, is if we had an electron that was in, for example, this orbital here, this one here, or this half of the orbital, okay, right? Then do you understand that as it's spinning, it can be found either over here or it could be found over here. So it could actually do something like this. Now I've pretended that this pit here is like a fan blade and it's going around, right? So it could go, the electron could go like this, oh, darn it. It could go like this and then it could go like that and then it can come out and then it can go right in and then come out and then in and so on, it keeps going around. Obviously, it doesn't usually do this, and where it's most likely to be found is out here. That's why these are bulbous shaped. But that is what we learned about in the last lesson. Now, drawing these things can be quite tricky, as you can see from my messy drawing. So what that happened was Daryl Afbar came along, and he produced what are called Afbar diagrams. Okay, so electric electron configurations can be represented using Aufbau diagrams after Mr. Aufbau. 
And what it happens is we've got little blocks and some textbooks show these are circles. So instead of a block, you'd have one S and there'd be a circle. It doesn't matter whether you draw blocks or circles, it's the same thing. Basically, we're saying that in here, are going to, that represents one orbital. Okay, that represents one orbital. Arrows are drawn in the blocks or circles to represent the electrons of the atom. Okay, the first energy level has only got one s orbital. Then the second energy level's got a two s and a two p. The third energy level's got three s, three p. And then you don't have to worry about 3D. We're not going to do 3D. So you only go as far as 4S, in fact, because of calcium. 4S2 is as far as we go. Okay, now, from energy 2, each energy level has an S and 3P orbitals. Please understand that every one of these blocks represents an orbital. Okay, so now we've got some rules that we need to go through. Firstly, there's Pauli's exclusion principle, and you need to learn these two. It's NB, they like asking them, they like you to be able to state them. And it says an orbital can contain a maximum of two electrons, provided they spin in the opposite directions. Okay, so they have to be spinning in the opposite direction. So in other words, they're spinning on their own axes. So this electron, if it's spinning like this, and there is a nucleus, and yeah, it's going around, it can have another electron on this side as long as it's spinning in the opposite direction. So it has to be spinning in the opposite direction. And the reason it has to be spinning in the opposite direction, just let me check this, that's going that way. That's actually the wrong way. That way, it's gonna be going that way. Because by the time, it, no, I was right the first time. So the reason it has to be spinning in the opposite direction is because it balances out the forces on it. If it doesn't spin in the opposite direction, then basically you are I'm just trying, oh no, I'm right. It has to be spinning like this. Okay, because if it's spinning in the opposite direction, it balances out the forces on the two electrons. If this spin in the same direction, this actually causes the orbital to wobble. So that can't happen, okay? So it just naturally doesn't happen. So Pauli's exclusion principle says that we would always find a maximum of two electrons in an orbital, but they only happen, it only happens if they spin in opposite directions. And Hunt's rule says no pairing of electrons will take place in p orbitals before all the orbitals contain at least one unpaired electron. In other words, over here, if say we've got something that's got 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, okay, that's how many electrons it's got, okay, then what happens is it's going to fill up the first two and these arrows, we do them in opposite directions to show that they have got opposite spins, okay, so and you do half an arrow to show it belongs to um, one orbital. So we've done those two. Now, this bit here, the 2p3, the way it works is we fill up every single one of these orbitals first before we move on. So in this case, it would be one, two, three. Okay. If this was 2p4, we now go back to the first one and fill it up. Okay. So you first fill up all the others, okay? No pairing of electrons will take place in p orbitals before all the orbit orbitals contain at least one unpaired electron. So that's how it shares the electrons, okay? So let's talk about how to draw the off-bar diagrams. First, you need to determine the number of electrons the atom has. You fill the s orbital the first energy level with the first two electrons. Then you fill the s orbital the second energy level with the next two. Then you put one electron in each of the three p, etc., and then you go on. Right. So let's look at an example. We're going to do silicon. We're going to play with silicon. Now, first of all, what you guys need to know is that silicon's symbol is Si. Okay. So we need to find Si. Now, I'm going to change color so you can see what I'm doing. So this is Si. So do you see it is in one, two, three, it is in period three, and it is in group one, two, three, four, it's in group four. Okay, we could also say, do you agree that it's got, how many electrons does it have? Okay, do you see that it's got 14 electrons? 14 electrons, because this number here tells us the number of 
electrons, the top number at the top. Okay, top number at the top. So we can see it's group three and group four, period four. And we can see that it has 14 electrons. So if we go back, let's go through this. Do you agree? It's got 1s2, okay? If we have to build it up, it's got two electrons in the first energy level, and the first energy level is only made up of one s orbit, orbital, right? Then it goes into the second energy level and fills all of these up, right? So it's got 2s2, 2p6, right? Then it goes into third energy level, and it fills up this s orbital here, so it's 3s2, and then do you agree it's got two electrons in the p orbitals on the third energy level? So it's 3p2. Now these numbers when added up are going to give us a number of electrons. So just let's check it. 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 6 is 10, plus 2 is 12, plus 2 is 14 electrons. Okay, so if we go here, we can say, okay, we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and it says we're in group three. Actually, this is group four, period three. So this is wrong. This is group four, period three. So therefore we know it's 3s2, 3p2. How do we know that? Well, we've, obviously looked here and said, well, this is one, two, sorry, one, two, three, so it's three periods, and it is one, two, three, four groups, so it's obviously a typo, so it's group four, period three, but that also tells us that period three means it's in the third energy level, and group four tells us it's got two electrons, I mean, four electrons in that energy level. So there's a four. So let's now draw our off bar diagram. So you always draw from the lowest energy up, okay? So we draw 1s2, 2s2. And guys, you need to be drawing these with a pencil and a ruler. I don't have the facility of a ruler on the software and obviously it'd be stupid for me to try and draw with a pencil. So you guys need to be drawing this nice and neatly with a ruler and a pencil. We then have 3s2 and 3p6. Right, so now I'm going to change color just to be able to show you how to do this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fill up our S orbitals. And remember, we have to have opposite spins. Then we're going to fill up our 2S orbital. Right. At 2P6 orbital. Now, I know it's all full, but I'm still going to show you the way you would do it so that you can practice it. So you'd fill up each orbital with one electron. And then we go back and fill up the electrons again in each of the orbitals, but they must have opposite spins. So now we've done this. Now we've got 3s2. And finally, we've got 3p2, which is going to be 1, 2. Okay. So although, actually, that's supposed to be a 2 there. So basically, what we're saying is that we've got two electrons in the 3p6 level. So it's but it's actually two electrons, that's it. So that is how you would draw your half bar diagram. Let's try another one. Let's try calcium. So again, I'm going to change color so you can see what I'm doing. And we can see, oh, look, I'm here. There is calcium. So how many periods? It's one, two, three, four. So that is four periods, right? And how many groups? It is two groups. Okay, so that is group two, period four. Okay, now, okay, if that's the case, and if we look at calcium, we see we got 20 electrons. So we want to get to period four, which is level four, energy level four. Okay, so we know the first energy level is made up of one 
s2 orbitals okay it's two electrons in that then you've got 2s2 oopsie then you got 2p6 then you got 3s2 i was looking to why it's doing that and then we got 3p6 and then we got 4s2 okay now you can see i've already filled in the first two electrons in that if i count these up two and two is four and six is ten and that becomes 12 that is 18 that's 20. so if i'm going to actually fill up all these electrons to get to calcium so again that is 2s2 now remember with 2p6 what do we do we always fill up one each on each of the orbitals and then we go up and fill up the rest the s orbital is easy then we go back with the p orbital we go one two three and then back four five and six and then obviously the s orbital is nice and easy now you guys might be saying well you knew it was going to look like this because it was all full so why did you have to draw it one 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 and then fill it up because it's good practice grade tens because you're going to get questions where you won't have a beautiful thing like this and it might be halfway through it might be 3p5 in which case you've got one two three four and five okay so you need to know how to do these things if i gave you 3p4 and you drew it like this and you went one two three four i would immediately know that you didn't know what you're talking about so this is why i say it is good to practice to show you to make sure that you understand how to draw these okay so now let's talk about the periodic table first of all a little bit of history there's this dude he was a Russian dude by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev. Now, it totally depends on which textbook you read as to how his name is spelt. But in 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev, who like I said, was a Russian physicist or scientist because he worked with chemicals as well, um, was struggling with the layout of different atoms. And what he did was actually quite clever. What he did was he took all the atoms or the elements that they knew about so far and he wrote down the information they knew about it and then he cut out the cards and he effectively played the equivalent of patience with it and i know if you didn't i'm sure you guys know the game patience when you rank cards like you'll go king queen jack 10 etc etc so what he did was he played with cards and he came up with this type of layout okay and it kind of looks like it could work because there's magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, etc. So he's got some idea of what is going on with the periodic table. And you see he's got hydrogen here by itself because he knows it's a little bit special and everything. But the gaps, and it's not quite the periodic table we noted. And the reason for that is because there were a whole bunch of elements, or quite a few elements that... Um, they didn't have the information of okay and and you can actually see that over here interestingly he actually predicted that they would find elements at with an atomic mass of 68 and one of 70. so he predicted it and he even predicted their nature and when they found these elements when they discovered them he was almost 100 percent spot on he actually predicted almost very very accurately what the nature of these elements would be how they would bond how they would react etc etc today we have the modern periodic table which is what we use now you guys won't obviously have a colorful one um, in your exams or in your you might have them in the classroom but not in your notes okay so let's just talk about this periodic table and then we will go through the arrangements okay so first of all, you need to know how they label it. Obviously, you've got these letters here, the H and the L I and the B E and everything are the symbols for the different elements. So a lot of this you already know is so that's hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, etc. etc. Okay, I'm not going through that with you. You guys can always look them up, and I'm sure your class teacher is going to make you learn at least up to the end of calcium and then some other random elements within the periodic table what you do need to know is the name of certain groups so for example and again you should know this 
This group here is, are the noble gases and they're the noble gases because they have got complete outer electron energy shells and therefore they don't react with anything else. Then we've got these here, which are called the alkali metals. Okay, they're called the alkali metals because when they dissolve in water, they form an alkali solution. And these ones here are called the alkali earth metals. And they do exactly the same thing. When in solution, they form alkalis, okay? But the reason we call them alkali earth metals is because these are the metals that are found in the earth's crust. Okay, group seven are called the halogens. Okay, and the last thing we need to worry about now are these things here, which are called the transition elements or sometimes the transition metals. And the reason they're called the transition elements metals is because sometimes, except for silver, they're Basically, they can change the number of electrons that they have on them, okay? Silver is always Ag plus, okay? The ionic charge. But copper, you can have copper 2 or you can have copper 1. Cobalt, you can have cobalt 1, cobalt 2, etc., etc. So it depends on what they're reacting with and how reactive the thing is that they're reacting with, okay? So basically, you can have different versions of copper oxide or copper 2 oxide, etc. Right, now, so that's what we know. Now let's talk about the actual arrangement of the periodic table. Elements are arranged according to the increasing atomic number and atomic mass. Elements with similar properties are arranged in vertical and horizontal families. The vertical columns are called groups and the horizontal rows are called periods. So this year, these year are groups, okay? And these year are periods. Okay, and these are groups. So the columns are groups, and the way we count them are one, two, skip a few, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The reason I say skip a few is because, like I mentioned before, the transition elements, the transition metals, can actually have different charges, okay, ionic structures. So we need to be aware of that. The periods are the rows, okay? Right. So let's have a look at these groups. If you look at them, you can see here there's group one. They call this group 14, but that's because they've counted the transition metals. So I'm gonna call this group four for what we know it as. This is group seven, and this is group eight. So as far as we're concerned, these are the noble gases. These are the halogens. And this is group four, which are actually a very important group. Okay, so if you look here, do you see that all the elements in the same group have the same number of valence electrons? Yes, one electron, one electron, one electron. Okay, group four has got one, two, three, four. Silicon, one, two, three, four. And group seven is going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so on. So every element in the same group has the same number of valence electrons. And these valence electrons are basically the electrons in the outer energy level. And they are the ones that actually get removed or transferred for bonding. So group one atoms are going to have one valence electron. Group four is going to have four, seven is going to have seven, and eight is obviously eight. Okay, now let's talk about the period, the period of the rows. So each period tells us that we've reached a new energy level or shell. Okay, so this is period one, hydrogen, helium, period two, period three. Okay, so we've just said that the period is obviously the energy level. Okay, so if you look here, do you see that period one is going to have one energy level? Period two has got two energy levels, and period three has got three energy levels. Okay, so now the periodic periodicity and tendency density trends. Okay, now grade tens. This section is a bit tedious. It's a bit tiring. It's not fun and exciting. It's not like you're gonna blow up anything in this section. I'm sorry to say, but. It is an incredibly important section, and I guarantee you they will ask you questions on it. 
and it actually will help you and if you can actually get to grips with it it will really help you not just this year but in grade 11 and grade 12. okay so period period periodic <laughs> sorry periodic means recurring at regular intervals okay so what they mean is when they call it a periodic table they mean that the atoms are arranged in a table in a manner that recurs or repeats regularly recurs or repeats regularly we know that each element in the group has the same number of valence electrons because we've shown you that okay let's just go up again remember we said in the group we've got the same number of valence electrons okay so the, if you've got the same number of valence electrons it means you've got similar properties and this is why we have trends in the periodic table and trends in this case mean like um, patterns okay so trends in the periodic table mean patterns so first of all you need to be able to identify the metals non-metals and metalloids within the periodic table so everything basically on the left hand side of the periodic table as well as all the lanthanides and actinides are metals and everything on the right as well as hydrogen are non-metals and then there's these special atoms that are between the metals and non-metals which are called metalloids okay and what's special about the metalloids is that they have both metallic and non-metallic structures and um, properties so now density density is defined as the mass divided by the volume okay density is defined defined as mass divided by volume so I often use this picture when I'm describing density because it kind of gives you an idea of what is more dense or less dense than other things. So right at the top, you've got a ping pong ball or a table tennis ball, which if you want to call it, you can also call it a table tennis ball. And the thing with it is that it is made of plastic, but it is filled with air. So for that reason, it has the least amount of mass per unit volume. And that's what this density means. It's how heavy it is divided by how much space it takes up, okay? Right, whereas over here, we've got a cherry tomato, which looks like it might have more or less the same volume, but we know that cherry tomatoes are not filled with space or vacuum or air, so therefore they're going to be more dense, okay? They're gonna be more dense. Um, if you look over here, you, then if you look over here, you've got a bolt, okay, a bolt or screw or what do you want to call it this is metallic and you can see that it actually has gone all the way down to the bottom and because that's because its mass is very high compared to its volume and therefore it has a very big density so the smaller the density the smaller the density the higher it floats okay the higher it floats so less than things are obviously going to float on more dense things okay so down here honey is except for the bolt honey is the most dense whereas lamp oil or rubbing oil or water are less dense okay so basically remember that density is your mass divided by your volume so it's by how heavy it is divided by how much space it takes up now you see density trends across the periodic table and that's what we need to talk about and this is why we mentioned density in the first place so if you look at this trend what they've done is someone has gone and looked at your period two period two that's your second row in your periodic table your second row okay and what they did was that they looked at lithium beryllium and boron okay lithium beryllium and boron and they measure the density and you can see that the density of the metal elements increase as we move across period two so as we move across the period the density increases so here's your lithium here's your beryllium and here's your boron now let's think about why do you think this would happen here's your lithium here's your beryllium and here's your boron do you agree over here we've got two electrons and the inner energy level and one on the outside yeah we've got two and two and yeah we've got two and three right 
But let's look at the number of neutrons and protons. Yeah, we've got three neutrons and we've got three protons. That's for lithium. For beryllium, we've got one, two, three, four, five. So we've got five neutrons and two, three, four. Four protons. Okay. Yeah, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six six neutrons and we've got one, two, three, four, five protons. So and do you see that the space that they're taking up is more or less the same? Now remember density equals mass over volume. And the mass from the atoms all come from the nucleus. So do you see that this has got a mass of say six units, this is a mass of nine units, and this is a mass of 11 units. But their volumes stay more or less the same. So therefore, we can say that because this has got more neutrons or nucleons, more nucleons, okay, and therefore more protons, it's going to have a greater density. So that's what it is. The number of protons you need to increase, blah, 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 mass of nuclear. Okay, there we go. I just said exactly all that. Okay. Now let's look at the density across the non metals. So the last four elements in period two are all gases. So we expect the densities to be low. Okay. So we've got lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. Okay, fine. Then we've got nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. And if you look here, you can see that the density is ridiculously low. In fact, it's so close, it's just about naught. Okay. And the reason is because all four of these elements are gases, okay, are gases. Now let's look at the trends in density, uh, trends in density across the period, okay. So this is the periods one through to three in the start of four, because it's the first 20 elements, okay. So yeah, is, okay, there's the first one, and Okay, wait, there's the first one, that's, peri that's period one. Then this up to here is period two. Then that up to there is period three. And that's the beginning of period four. Okay, so now do you see that the density of the metals increases? Whereas the density of the non-metals decreases, goes down to zero. Then the density of the metals increase. Yeah, the density of the non-metals decreases. There's a little bit of an anomaly here, which we'll talk about that later. And then again, it increases. So we can see that across the period, the density of the metal increases and the density of the non-metal decreases. So if we look at the trends in densities across a down a group, so he has hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. So we're getting down group one. And you can see that hydrogen has got very little density, okay, because it's a gas. Then as you're going up, except for this little bit of a glitch here with the sodium, do you see that it actually does that? And we can easily see that the further down we go, the greater the greater the density, the greater the density. Okay. Again, if we look over here, you can see if we follow this rule, and this is again along group two, then the density increases as we move down the group. Okay, except for a little glitch there, but we'll worry about the glitches later. Right, so now let's talk about the periodic table and the melting points. Unfortunately for you grade 10s, a lot of this is plain learning work. It's a bit of understanding and you need to be able to explain it. And I will go through exam paper questions on this section when we have finished the section to make sure you understand how you'll be asked about this. But you need to understand this and you need to understand the bonding that makes these things happen in order to be able to solve and answer questions, not just this year, but also in grade 11 and grade 12. So let's talk about melting and boiling points. Okay, a melting point is a temperature at which a solid changes phase to liquid at standard atmospheric pressure. Okay, so we're talking about STP, standard atmospheric pressure, because the pressure affects your 
boiling point and it affects your melting point. So the temperature at which your solid changes to liquid is considered to be a melting point. Even if the melting point is 1500 degrees Celsius, the temperature at which it goes from solid to liquid is a melting point. Boiling point is the temperature to which a liquid changes phase to a gas at standard atmospheric pressure. Okay, so if an object if, I mean, sorry, if a liquid changes phase to a gas at a standard atmospheric pressure, then that temperature is the boiling point. So now, if you look at this periodic table, we're looking at the phases of the elements on the periodic table for what would be at room temperature. Okay, in other words, do you see that most of the periodic table, most of it, are made up of this horrible icky yellow color, right? And the reason is that all of these elements are generally found, or are found, to be solid at room temperature. At room temperature. Okay, they are solid at room temperature. The green ones are gas at room temperature, and the blue ones are liquid at room temperature. So you can see there's only mercury and bromine that are liquid at room temperature. The rest are either solid or gas. So that's quite interesting about the periodic table and all the elements on the periodic table. So now let's look at the melting and boiling points and how they change across the period. Now remember the period is as we go across the periodic table. So we've got lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and then nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. So the orange color is the boiling point, and this is the temperature goes from a liquid to a gas, whereas the melting point is the temperature at which they go from a, oh, sorry, from a solid to a liquid and vice versa. Okay, and you can see that they both, this, this is the melting point and it increases and the boiling points increase. So both the melting and boiling points increase from lithium all the way to carbon in cross period two. Now let's talk about that. Your gases in period two are nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and neon. Okay, those are your gases in period two. Let's just go back up for a second. So you can see you've got lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. Up to this point here, the melting points and boiling points go up. These have their own little thing going on and these are your gases. Okay, so let's have a look. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and neon are all gases at room temperature. So that means they have melting points below zero degrees Celsius. So we have to have a decrease in melting points from nitrogen to neon because of the way these molecules are arranged and their bonding abilities. So nitrogen has a temperature of minus 101 degrees is a temperature at which it changes from a liquid to a gas. Okay. Hmm. Similarly, oxygen Okay, it goes, it changes from a gas to liquid at minus 218.3, fluorine minus 200, but neon is minus 248.5 degrees, and that is because it is a noble gas. Right. Now let's look at period three. So you can see period three has got a very similar trend. Okay, it's going up. Okay, and then the last four, well, the last two, definitely there is negligible, but phosphorus and sulfur have some bit of energy required, okay, and the temperature changes at, I mean, as positive in temperatures. Right, period two and period three. So let's compare period two and period three. Yeah, you've got lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and yeah, you've got sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, and silicon. So we can see that the non-metals have a much lower boiling point and melting point than the metals, okay? So even though carbon is considered to be both a metal and a non-metal, in the sense that it can act as both um, a conductive electricity and a non-conductive electricity, or it has 
properties of both. It's a, basically it's a metalloid, but not really. Okay, whereas silicon is definitely a metalloid, but do you see that they still have very high values, and that's because there's strong bonds between them. So the metals basically have got nice high boiling points and melt points, similarly over here. But yeah, you've got a metalloid, metalloid. Oopsie. And that has got a high energy requirement for breaking and forming a liquid at room temperature. And the reason is because of the fact that they have very strong bonds between the atoms. And yeah, you can see that these are non-metals and these are non-metals and they have got much lower boiling and melting points. Right, now let's look at the groups. Now remember the groups are as we go up or down the periodic table. And in this case, this is group one. So if we look at this, we can see this is the boiling point and this is the melting point. And you can see the boiling point actually decreases as we go down the periodic table. Okay, the boiling point decreases as well as the melting point. Okay, and why is that? Well, if you think about it, the boiling point and melting point are the temperatures at which substances change from a solid to liquid or liquid to gas. So in other words, it's the temperatures at which they are easier to break up. Okay, and the reason for this is because cesium has got much freer electrons in the outer energy shell than lithium. So the further you go down, the bigger the atom, the bigger the atom, the more easy it is to extract electrons from it. Okay, right, so summary. The melting point of non-metals is much lower than metals. Okay, the melting points of non-metals much lower than metals. The melting points increase for metals as we move along the period, but decrease for non-metals. And the melting points increase as we move down the periodic table. Right, grade 10s, I think that's enough about the periodic table for today. We can carry on next time I see you, which I think is on Thursday. Please, please, please make sure you understand this. And I know it's tedious, but please go learn the stuff. Because if you understand this now and you understand how the periodic table works, there are so, there's so much information that we can glean from the periodic table, which means we don't actually have to go learn it for the exams. We can just, if we understand what's going on the periodic table, we can use that information to help us solve all our chemical problems. Well, not all, but a lot of our chemical problems. Right, okay, that's enough for today. Have a great day.